This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Rodrigo smith Tapata, John and Becky Johnston, and Chris Benito, And also our new boss, Bo, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Bo, and welcome. On this episode of DTNS, Reddit third-party apps face uncertain fates, WhatsApp goes the news route with a new channel feature, and the more we learn about Apple Vision Pro, the more we say, what is it good for? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, June 8th, 2023. From studio Where Are My XLR Cables, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. From deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. So in yesterday's GDI, we talked about the Twitch backlash over its new ad restrictions. Now, in response, Twitch has decided not to implement them as they were originally laid out. The new rules would have prevented streamers from showing pre-recorded audio and video of sponsors, as well as limiting the size of sponsored graphics to 3% of the screen. After several streamers threatened to leave, or actually did leave the platform, Twitch announced, these guidelines are bad for you and bad for Twitch, and we are removing them immediately. Well, Adobe announced Firefly for Enterprise, which lets employees in an organization use generative AI to write prompts to create images or text. Enterprise users can access Firefly from its app, Creative Cloud, or Adobe Express, so you have options. And admins can train their instance of Firefly on corporate assets. Things like brand logos, styles help get really those nailed down in the models. Firefly was launched in March, and the enterprise version will not launch until it comes out of beta. Kind of breaking news here. The Verge reports that Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg has addressed the Apple Vision Pro headset uh, in a uh, in a in a in a uh, a, a, a note to employees on Thursday, he said, it could be the vision of the future of computing, but like, it's not the one that I want. Take that as you will. We will talk more about that if there is more to talk about on tomorrow's show. But moving on in the quick hits, Google would launch its news showcase product in the U.S. Uh, you might say, didn't it already have a new showcase? Yeah, it launched back in 2020 in Brazil and Germany, but has since expanded to over 22 countries. New showcase offers a dedicated space within search designed to drive traffic to high quality partnered publishers. In the U.S., Google will provide funding to 150 news publishers across 39 states, 90% of which are regional and local. SK Hynix announced Wednesday it has begun mass production of its 238-layer 4D NAND memory for high-performance SSDs. PC enthusiasts will note the fast 2400 mega transfers per second data transfer rate, and if you're keeping track, that's about a 50% increase over the previous generation. These can be used to build solid state drives with read write speeds of 12 gigabytes per second or higher, taking advantage of new PCI Express Gen 5 capacity. SK Hynix expects the memory to show up first in smartphones. Aura is adding a new community feature to its smart ring. Uh, Aura users can now create or join circles to share things like readiness, sleep, and activity scores from the past two weeks with their friends. Aura's sleep staging algorithm is also out of beta for Android and iOS. Uh, the Aura ring sells for $300, and it comes with a monthly subscription. All right, well, over the years, the extremely popular app WhatsApp has added a lot of features, but at its core, it remains a chat app. That means you're in a conversation, whether one-on-one -on -one or you're in a group, it's, you know, it's kind of a two-way street. You can send and receive stuff. Well, that might be changing a little bit with a new feature for the app called Channels. Meta calls this a private way to follow what matters, designed so that channel operators can broadcast to people to in the conversation one way so you can't reply to you're just you're just kind of following a feed there meta definitely see this as a creator tool with plans to build in payment and monetization services privacy is a mixed bag for the service on the one hand it only stores 30 days of channel history and admins can block screenshots and forwards trying to keep you know what's in that channel to that channel on the other hand though channels are not end-to-end -end encrypted a big selling point for you know the rest of whatsapp's chatting 
Yeah, so others have experimented with this. Uh, for example, you might recall Telegram uh, had a similar channels feature for years. And you might say, well, okay, is this just WhatsApp keeping up with, you know, what folks are doing within, quote unquote, you know, d d you know two-way conversations within apps? Or do we feel like it's part of a grander design for how, how you know, a, a, an app like WhatsApp delivers news? Justin, what are your thoughts? I'm so glad we finally started talking about journalism. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, 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 I think that this is a very, very interesting week to talk about this because there was a profile from The Atlantic uh, that essentially was the straw that broke the camel's back in getting the CEO of CNN fired. Uh, and that was remarkable because it was behind a paywall. And it makes you think, the New York Times behind a paywall, the Atlantic behind a paywall, the Wall Street Journal behind a paywall. What we think of as the standard of news is increasingly becoming and increasingly stricter about not letting free users read their content. And so what we used to think of back in the day as the, the elements to pick up the slack of that was blogs. But blogs don't really exist in the same way anymore. And we've seen Substack sort of take that position, but also Substack are, are soft paywalled, or at least they want people to be able to monetize their work. The point of all of this is to say that free media is in flux. The way that we, on a very sampling level, can interact with the news is something that we are still trying to figure out exactly how and what that means. The fact that WhatsApp is doing this is just another place where they are saying, well, look, Telegram, it works there. Uh, uh, obviously, we already have community functions like Discord. Why don't we build out different ways that people can send the news to places where people read a lot? And on mm -hmm. WhatsApp, you read a lot. Yeah, and, and seeing this announcement, it, it's got me thinking like usually – I don't want to mischaracterize Meta's product uh, strategy or anything like it, but usually when a new feature comes out, you're like, all right, what are they, what, what is popular that they are trying to bring into their platform and draw eyeballs on Meta? Never. I, I, I know. I, I hate to besmirch their, their clean and completely original product uh, development strategy. However, like this actually does seem like it kind of is a unique vision or, or at least is not a, is not a direct copy, right? Cause I've seen some coverage of this saying, Oh, it's like Twitter, except there's no replying and stuff like that. And that doesn't really like hold water. I see some elements of discord in there because it is in this chat interface. I definitely see a lot of Substack in there and that plays into uh, some code references that WhatsApp beta info uh, has discovered that there are actually like newsletter features and tools being developed by meta as well. That seems to be the most direct to me, but what is interesting to me is, is that this seems at least like a somewhat novel or, or at least a, a, a more organic way, I guess, to build out this type of product as opposed to we slapped it into the main Facebook app or, you know, uh, you know, something in something in Instagram. I don't know. Th this seems like an organic extension of what people are already using WhatsApp for in a way that just builds monetization that then Meta can also make money off of as well. 100%. I mean, there are a lot of WhatsApp users. I mean, every time I go out of the US, for example, it's like, okay, let's get on the WhatsApp channel. <laughs> <You know? laughs> let's figure out the WhatsApp group. Or even if enough of us get together, you know, people say, yeah, WhatsApp, that's the better group texting option kind of thing. If you're in there to uh, talk with your friends, great. Um, if you can stay in there to get news updates and, you know, learn about stuff and even, you know, news organizations can, can disseminate news to you, a la Apple News or, you know, s some other options, also great. There's no reason that WhatsApp shouldn't experiment with this. I think it's, I think it's a good call. I don't personally use WhatsApp all that much, probably because I should travel more. Uh, and you know, I'm just sort of, I'm just sort of sitting in California, um, you know, wasting away. But, uh, but yeah, I think, I think this, I have friends who say, oh, anything I want to find out about on the news, I just like search on TikTok and I eventually figure it out. And I'm like, that is a very strange way to gather news perhaps, but also we used to say that about people searching things on YouTube. And now that's very, very, you know, the status quo. So, you know, here we are. 
Uh, one one quick thing about uh, WhatsApp. It is an app that a lot of people already have alerts turned on for because they don't want to miss a message from friends. So it mm. will already skip to the front of the line in terms of breaking news where if you develop a trust with somebody who's going to be able to tell you a thing when it is happening, uh, that matters a lot. Well, the third-party Reddit app Apollo, uh, the third-party Reddit app Apollo, their developer Christian Selig announced his third-party iOS app will shut down June thirtieth. This is in response to Reddit now requiring developers to pay to access its API, which many devs have called financially unfeasible. Selig said last month that Reddit is charging twelve thousand dollars per fifty million requests, and because of Apollo's popularity, that would add up to twenty million dollars per year for Apollo. Yeah. So for anybody who's not familiar with Apollo or other third party apps that work the same way, Apollo has added new features and updates on a regular basis. It is a third party iOS app that is designed for, you know, hardcore Reddit users who would prefer this third party app over the native app. That might sound familiar to anybody who's gone <laughs> through this with other apps. Now, Selig claims he's tried to work out a deal with Reddit to no avail because Reddit claimed at one point that Selig tried to extort money from the company because of how he was accessing the former API. Even so, going forward, Selig says he thinks he could rewrite the code to make Apollo more efficient in the long run and, you know, be part of the Reddit TOS, but not within the 30 days that Reddit has given him to switch to a subscription model and migrate his users and make other updates. So we've got Twitter and Twitch and YouTube and now Reddit. Many third-party devs, uh, you know, have, have fallen afoul of this exact type of thing. It is hard out there for the third-party dev. So Justin, what do you think the solution is when you build on a platform that you really have no jurisdiction over? Uh, uh, put 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 one in the sky for modernity sweeping over you. This is, <laughs> there, there's nothing to do. Whistle into the breeze, I guess. Uh, uh, look, the, the song remains the same. These apps are being deliberately killed by Reddit. Let's let's dispel with this fiction that this is just them setting a price for the API. No, they are deliberately trying to kill this and they are making it so expensive that these apps will likely die. And I guess for them, they look at it as a better solution than just saying no API access for you. Uh, uh, they're saying like, I guess if, uh, uh, if you want to offer to your users a $300 a year subscription plan, then sure, keep using this <laughs> app. Uh, the, the reality is, is that all of these websites that are extremely popular and rely on advertising want to control their end-to-end -end okay. user experience for a lot of different reasons, but advertising certainly one of them. We're in a very, very slippery, decomposing advertising world. And, you know, much like we saw even, uh, Sarah, you mentioned in, in the quick hits, what Twitch was looking to do with their stuff. That's all so they can protect their ability to sell ads on their own platform. And, and I think that moves like this are part of it as well. I, I would also say specifically in Reddit's cases, but we're seeing this in other platforms too, not just the advertising tightening up, but I think a lot of these platforms have uh, have been having trouble consistently growing kind of on that, you know, used to being on that constant growth curve and that is smoothing out or in the case of a lot of pandemic related, uh, you know, growth, we're, we're seeing a regression uh, across some platforms in terms of that. And so when you, when you have that, the, the emphasis is, we, we've seen this with Netflix, for example, the emphasis on like extracting more value from your existing subscriber base, as opposed to bringing in new users. And this, of course, plays into what you were saying, Justin, about wanting to control the entire experience, because that allows you to, you know, maximize monetization, not as much of a concern when you can count on, you know, consistent uh, uh, growth or you have in the past when platforms like this are, are kind of seeing, hey, we, we don't necessarily, you know, Reddit had a lot of ambitions to grow into more video services, uh, you know, bring on uh, mm -hmm. different extensions to grow itself, audio platforms and stuff like that. And it's kind of returning to a core functionality and being like, we need to maximize what we are getting out of our user base and not assume that we're going to be seeing, you know, crazy growth forever. 
Well, it's also a fundamentally different business model. Uh, if you are building a service for which you are asking other people to develop apps for, then it limits what you're able to do in terms of the services that you will offer to your users. If you control end-to-end -end from the very, very beginning of it to the very end experience, then you have more ability to make changes because you're not worried about those features being broken or inaccessible on third-party apps. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is where I'll, I'll play the uh, role of Tom Merritt and say, you know, if you are building your uh, 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 third party apps on uh, services that use open protocols, this can't happen to you, it turns out. Uh, but the, but again, these are these are private companies. You know, this is this is you're not building an email client. You are building a Reddit client. Yes. You're not building a Mastodon client. You're you know you are building off of Reddit's platform, and they you know they set those rules, fair or not, uh, for third parties who have given to be fair, given a ton of value to Reddit over time uh, and made a lot of their users very happy. Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying I'm happy to see this. I'm just well, saying. Well, and that yay, that's sort of that's I use the official that... app anyway. Whatever. <laughs> Yeah, I I actually don't use Apollo. Um, I I understand that Apollo was well loved. Um, it reminds me of Tweetbot, uh, which mm -hmm. was you know my Twitter client of choice uh, on mobile and even uh, on a uh, Mac um, Mac OS client for I don't know fifteen years. I mean, we're, <laughs> what year is it anymore? Um, mm -hmm. And you know when that all sort of went to heck, I thought, well, they'll work something out. They have to. Well, they didn't. Um, and these things happen. And so it goes. So that, you know, as a developer, not that you shouldn't, uh, you know, create uh, really great products for people who want them. But um, it is it is the unfortunate uh, situation when a company wants to go in a different direction because they are not beholden to you at all. All right. Well, if you well, are that, feeling on that fun note, <laughs> <Yeah>. mm -hmm. <laughs> well, if if you're not feeling social on Reddit, but you are feeling uh, social, want to get a hold of us? We are on the socials. We are on at DTNS Show on Twitter and at Mastodon. Look for us at MSTDN dot social, and we're also on TikTok at Daily Tech News Show and at DTNS Picks on Instagram. <laughs> Well, as WWDC uh, continues on this week, we keep getting more intel on the Vision Pro headset. That was the big keynote. Uh, that was on Monday. We're now at Thursday, uh, depending on where you are and wh when you're listening. But uh, the entire week is built for developers. Now, one is through an Apple developer session, which showed off how a virtual keyboard would look inside the Vision Pro as you type on it mid-air. Remember, you're not holding controllers, you're just typing in air. Initially, Apple touted the headset as a way to look at UI elements, make small hand gestures, and, you know, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was, uh, it had some fanfare there. But the developer session uh, that is of note focused more on tasks that need to use more tactile interaction, reaching out, touching UI elements, using physical keyboards and trackpads, or game controllers. So the virtual keyboard was a big one because it's definitely not tactile. Apple designer Eugene Kriver Cucho showed off how this is designed to work, noting, while the finger is above the keyboard, buttons display a hover state and highlight that gets brighter as you approach the button surface. Then it provides a proximity cue and helps guide the finger to target. At the moment of contact, the state change is quick and responsive and is accompanied by ma matching spatial sound effect. Now, Rich, this all sounds pretty fun, pretty exciting. We're getting more information about this, but not everybody is super pumped, right? Yeah, we are, we are definitely seeing some reactions, uh, not all enthusiastic uh, for the Vision Pro, uh, including from Wired's uh, Kate Nibs, has a very different vision for this indeed writing. This is not a revolutionary gadget, no matter how confident Tim Cook looks when he says it is. It's a rare misfire and a sign that Apple is losing its ability to turn tech geek novelties into normie must-haves. She goes on to say, every successful Apple product of the past two decades has disappeared into our lives in some way. The iPhone into our pockets, the iPad into our purses, the Apple Watch living on our wrists, and the AirPods resting on our ears. You know, there's, you know, it's a big headset, right? The Vision Pro is not necessarily going to disappear uh, you're wearing it or, or you're not. Uh, it's just going to be there. But Justin, I'm curious, 
What are your thoughts? We're getting some look into the UI and some of the maybe some of the uh, contrarian backlash here. How did Dvorak not write this column? <laughs> like, like what, what is going on? Somebody wake up Dvorak. This is the classic Dvorak column, right? Like, like this is uh, 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 maybe maybe it, it's good. It's a sign of his legendary status that this is now more of a mainstream uh, uh, take to have. Uh, I think it's off base. I, I do think that if, 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 and let me also say this, that the world of AR and VR has been filled with, and I don't say this lightly, Theranos grade lies for the last <laughs> 10 years, like overstating, if not totally fabricating technology that has led us to believe that a level of experience was possible when it was not. Uh, so, Apple is making these claims. We've known that they've worked on this for a long time. We've understood that the tech has existed in our iPhones for a long time. If what they are saying, and I mean two claims specifically, the vision of being able to see small words and making it a, if not a, a readable experience, an enjoyable or more uh, efficient experience to read in this and if that UI without any controllers is as smooth as they are selling, then this is a transformational device. Uh, uh, what they are expecting is for this to not even be in the world of AR and VR. That's haunted tech to them. The reason why they use the term spatial computing was because they wanted to be a cut above, much in mm. the same way that the iPhone made the sidekick, then an extraordinarily cool phone that I owned, look antiquated the day that it came out that is what the vision pro aims to do with the oculus whether or not mark zuckerberg thinks that it's for him you know what one of the uh you know the comparison to you know you got the iphone you can put in your pocket you know the ipad you could put in a purse or a bag you know something a little bit or maybe a large pocket i don't know apple watch <laughs> it's on your wrist airpods it's uh, they're on your ears they just sort of go away and become part of you. That is not false, but I feel like saying, "Well, we need the the this new uh, um, uh, uh, Vision Pro headset to also somehow be in the background." There's simply no way. I mean, until we have like weird contacts that we can put into our eyes to do the same thing that this uh, the 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 idea that people only want technology that just sort of goes into the background. That is just, I think that's silly. Um, it, it, it's it, or if that's what you want, then you're not, you're never going to uh, embrace any sort of technology like this. Now I know it's a big sell. It's a big sell to put something on your face. I mean, I've been telling people how much I love VR for years, and most people are like, eh, not for me. Got it, yeah. you know. But 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 uh, but but that's not. That's not what Apple's going for. Apple's not trying to trying to pretend that you just sort of like put it in your backpack and all of a sudden you can see, you know, you know, some augmented reality version of your of of your universe. Uh, Rich, 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 I, I apologize for stepping on you here, uh, but but uh, also the the general idea that we have not had culture bend around the concept of Apple devices is absurd. If you were to do a time travel movie where you went from the seventies to anywhere after 2007, the immediate visual way that you would demonstrate that is people looking at their phones. Yes. Like it has become a part of society. Yeah. We have reoriented boredom around phones they have not disappeared into the background we have changed to adapt to them because yes they, they provide a utility to us and we enjoy them and honestly like like that's the most off base thing for me what what actually to me where this feels I don't, revolutionary probably the biggest swing is that this is not a thing that's tied to the iphone which is the 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 delta from which all of their other tributaries of wealth have come like all of their successful product categories are spinoffs of uh, of the iphone the iphone is their big money maker the ipad is for the longest time a big iPhone. The AirPods are the, the the headphones for the iPhone. The Apple Watch only works with an iPhone. Their unsuccessful product categories are the ones that don't make them all of the bags of money are Apple TV, which you can use with anything and isn't part of necessarily the iPhone ecosystem, and the HomePod, which again is not a part of that ecosystem. So that to me is more the where I would be like, 
this is not a guaranteed success for Apple and they are going to have to, you know, they have to, they are counting on making the right compromises with this product uh, in to, to kind of reach a, a more mass audience over the course of years. Uh, but it is not, yeah, this idea of, of disappearing into the background, I think is, is a little bit of a, uh, a mythology <laughs> that we're telling ourselves. Just, I love that analogy of, yeah, someone from the 70s is showing up in like any place where anyone is waiting and being like, who are you weird people with all of your weird little slabs? Shout out to Dvorak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Could have been you, John C. Could have been you. <laughs> He's a legend. He's, he deserves a rest. Well, maybe he's on a cruise, uh, and if he is, you might want to look at the Norwegian <laughs> cruise company Hurtigruten that has a new concept design for a zero-emission cruise ship called Sea Zero, what the company calls the world's most energy-efficient cruise ship, featuring a 60-megawatt-hour battery bank that will be charged with renewable energy while in port. Wind and solar energy from retractable sails with uh, solar panels are designed to charge the batteries while cruising, extending to a maximum height of 50 meters with 1,500 square meters of photovoltaic panels and a wind surface of 750 square meters. C0 has a few other bells and whistles, uh, you know, just, just some niceties like AI maneuvering, contra-rotating propellers, those sound fun, and multiple retractable thrusters. And since we're talking about some solar and other solar news, the Solar Energy Industries Association, or SEIA, uh, and Wood McKenzie issued an estimate that solar capacity in the U.S. is expected to triple in size to 378 gigawatts by 2028. Man, I know that cruise, I haven't been on a cruise in quite some time, but I know that they are notorious uh, carbon emission uh, nightmares. Um, mm -hmm. You know, everybody loves a cruise. Well, the people who love a cruise love a cruise, <laughs> right? Yeah. Maybe not everybody. But, but um, it is, this is not, you know, this is not a carbon neutral situation. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of energy and a lot of gas and a lot of oil and a lot of stuff that goes into the uh, atmosphere that comes along with this. I know this is simply a concept design and it mm -hmm. sounds like, um, for Her Herdy Gruten, um, the the ship would be relatively small, 500 guests, 270 cabins, a crew of 99. Um, that's, you know, if, if, if all goes well um, and they can set sail in, uh, you know, in a few years. Um, so that's that that is not a huge cruise. But hey. We're getting somewhere, right? If this is a proof of concept that uh, that can that can make uh, folks that love a good cruise feel better about being on that good cruise, I am all for it. And if it brings yeah, back tall I, I'm ships, gonna, I mean, come on, that's kind of. I'm cool. gonna need. I'm gonna need some backup gas. Well, I don't know if I'm in international <laughs> waters. I, I don't. Wanna, I don't want to chance it. What the full voltaic panels and wind surface? Uh, I don't know for you nice, nice. Time. I'm not saying uh, look, uh, great, uh, great project. Again, uh, concept. For me, for we're, me. we're just we're we're gonna hang concept. out in Norway for a little bit and That's see fine. how it goes. Let's and have then, a great time. And then about it. we're you know wider availability coming sure. coming soon to you. Exactly. Um, all right, uh, so let's check let's check out the mailbag. This one comes in from Doug, who says. I'm not sure if I'm right, but I wonder if the, in my opinion, useless addition of being able to create animated stickers and messages from photos is a way for Apple to say, we'd love to do RCS, but it just didn't support all our functionality. Of course, Doug is talking about the keynote from Monday. Uh, Doug says, I couldn't find an equivalent method in Android for what Apple showed off on Monday, and it's the kind of move I could just see a big company making. A daily reminder that some people have iPhones and other people don't. Oh, I never. Like, sure, yeah. yeah Apple will always keep that green text bubble going there, <laughs> so you know that uh, uh, this is a cultural marker. And it also speaks to the fact that RCS is old tech. Like, it's the implementation has taken forever to roll out. But th this, the reason it's not supporting cutting edge stuff is because it was developed a while ago, and we're only just starting to see, you know, mass industry adoption outside of uh, a certain company in Cupertino. Mm -hmm. Well, Justin Robert Young, thank you as always for being with us. Uh, what would you like to tell folks about uh, today? Because you do so many things. I would like to tell people about Know a Little More, 
which is hosted by Tom Merritt and produced uh, by Amos, who also works on this show, uh, Daily Tech News Show. And, and I helped as a, a executive producer with Dog and Pony Show Audio. Uh, I, I uh, really, really enjoyed working on this season. And I hope everybody goes back and listens to it. If you haven't given it a shot, then please consider it. Know a little more where all podcasts are found. All right. Remember, people of the Patreon, stick around for the extended show. Good day, Internet. We'll be talking about deep fakes. And as we get closer to the next U.S. presidential election, how they're cropping up in order to confuse people on which politicians did what and when. Oh, can you imagine anyone doing such a thing? Impropriety in politics? I know. I know. Wow. Uh, But anyway, uh, you can catch the show, whether we're talking politics, tech, you know, cruise ships. Well, we do all of those things. Monday through Friday, we are live, 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow with Shannon Morse joining us and Len Peralta join us as well, drawing the top tech stories. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this broker. <laughs>